January 10th, 1958. Hey, Frankie, I don't know whether I ever told you how dearly I love that Tristram Shandy. The Rob illustrations are enchanting. Now then, in the back, there's a list of other McDonald illustrated classics, which includes the Essays of Eliah. I'd love to have this in the McDonald edition, or any nice edition, if it's reasonable, of course. Nothing's cheap anymore, it's reasonable, or sensibly priced. There's a building going up across the street. The sign over it says, one and two bedroom apartments at rents that make sense. Rents do not make sense, and prices do not go around being reasonable about anything, no matter what it says in the ad, which isn't an ad anymore, it's a commercial. I go through life watching the English language being raped before me face. <laughs> yes, whatever became of Plato's minor dialogues? 11th of March, 1958, dear Helene, about the McDonald classics, we do get a few from time to time, but there are none at the moment. We had several copies of Lamb's Essays of Elia earlier on, but they were snapped up during the holiday rush. I am off on a buying trip next week and will look out for one for you, not forgetting the Plato. Faithfully yours, Frank. 18th March, 1959. Dear Helene, I don't know how to break the bad news, but two days after offering you the shorter Oxford Dictionary for your friend, a man came in and bought it when my back was turned. I have delayed replying to your letter in the hope that another one would come along, but no luck yet. I am terribly sorry to disappoint your friend, but you can blame it all on me, as I really ought to have reserved it. We are sending off by book post today the Johnson on Shakespeare, which we happen to have in stock in the Oxford Press edition with an introduction by Walter Raleigh. We are all sorry to hear that your television shows have moved to Hollywood, and that one more summer will bring us every American tourist but the one we want to see. I can quite understand your refusal to leave New York for Southern California. We have our fingers crossed for you and hope that some sort of work will turn up soon. Sincerely, Frank. August 15, 1959. Sir, I write to say I have got work. I want it. I want a $5,000 granted aid off CBS. It's supposed to support me for a year while I write American history dramatizations. I am starting a script about New York under seven years of British occupation, and I marvel at how I rise above it to address you in friendly and forgiving fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Your behavior over here from 1776 to 1783 was simply filthy. Is there, a, is there such a thing as a modern English version of the, Ch of the Canterbury Tales? I have these guilts about never having read Chaucer. But I was talked out of learning early Anglo-Saxon Middle English by a friend who had to take it for her PhD. They told her to write an essay in early Anglo-Saxon on any subject of her own choosing, which is all very well, she said bitterly, but the only essay subject you can find enough early Anglo-Saxon words it for is how to slaughter a thousand men in a meat hall. <laughs> she also filled me in on Beowulf and his illegitimate son, Sidwith, or, or is it Widsith? She says it's not worth reading, so that killed my interest in the entire subject. Just send me a modern Chaucer. Love to Nora, H.H. Ah. 2nd September 1959, dear Helene, we were all delighted to hear that you won a grant in aid and are working again. We are prepared to be broad-minded about your choice of subject matter. <laughs> but I must tell you that one of the young inmates here confessed that until he read your letter, he never knew that England had ever owned the States. <laughs> Chaucer, the best scholars seem to have fought shy of putting him into modern English, but there was an edition put out by Longman in 1934, The Canterbury Tales Only, a modernized version by Hill, which I believe is quite good. It is, of course, out of print, and I am trying to find a nice, clean, second-hand copy for you. Sincerely, Frank. Sunday night and a hell of a way to start 1960. I don't know, Frankie. Somebody gave me this book for Christmas. It's a giant modern library book. Did you ever see one of those? It's less attractively bound than the proceedings of the New York State Assembly, and it weighs more. It was given to me by a gent who knows I'm fond of John Donne. The title of this book is The Complete Poetry and Selected Prose of John Donne and The Complete Poetry of William Blake. The question mark is mine. Will you please tell me what those two boys have in common, except that they were both English and they both wrote? Yeah. 
I tried reading the introduction, figuring that might explain it. The introduction is in four parts. Parts one and two include a professor's life of Dunn, mid illustrations from the author's works, also criticism. Part three begins, and God knows I quote, when, as a little boy, William Blake saw the prophet Ezekiel under a tree amid a summer field, he was soundly trounced by his mother. I'm with his mother. <laughs> I mean, the back of the Lord God or the face of the Virgin Mary, all right. But why the hell would anybody want to see the prophet Ezekiel? <laughs> I don't like Blake anyway. He swoons too much. It's done, I'm writing about. I am being driven clear of the wall, Frankie. You have got to help me. Here I was, curled up in my armchair, so at peace with the world, with something old and serene on the radio, Corelli or somebody, and this thing on the table, this giant modern library thing. So I thought I would read the three standard passages from Sermon 15 aloud. You have to read done aloud. It's like a Bach fugue. Would you like to know what I went through in an innocent attempt to read three contiguous, uncut passages from Sermon 15 aloud? So, break it to me gently. How hard is it going to be to find me John Dunn's complete sermons? And how much is it going to cost? I'm going to bed. I will have hideous nightmares involving huge monsters and academic robes carrying long, bloody butcher knives labeled excerpts, collection, selection, passage, and abridged. <laughs> Yours, H. H. Fifth of March, 1960, dear Helene, I'm afraid the complete Dunn sermons can only be had by buying Dunn's complete words. This runs to more than 40 volumes and would be very expensive in good, in good condition. We hope you had a good Christmas and New Year in spite of the giant modern library. <laughs> Sincerely, Frank. May 8, 1960. Monsieur de Tocqueville's compliments, and he begs to announce his safe arrival in America. He sits around looking smug because everything he said was true, especially about lawyers running the country. I enclose three bucks. It's a beautiful book, and you can't even call it secondhand. The pages weren't cut. Did I tell you I finally found the perfect page cutter? It's a pearl-handled fruit knife. My mother left me a dozen of them. I keep one in the pencil cup by my desk. Maybe I go with the wrong kind of people, but I'm just not likely to have 12 guests all sitting around simultaneously eating fruit. <laughs> Cheers, H.H. February 2nd, 1961. Frank? You still there? I swore I wouldn't write till I got work. Sold a story to Harper's Magazine, slaved over for three weeks, and they paid me $200 for it. Now they've got me writing the story of my life in a book. They're advancing me $1,500 to write it, and they figure it shouldn't take me more than six months. I don't mind for myself, but the landlord worries. So I can't buy any books. But back in October, Somebody introduced me to Louis the Duke de Saint-Simon in a miserable abridgment, and I tore around to the society library where they let you roam the stacks and lug everything home and got the real thing. Have been wallowing in Louis ever since. The, the edition I'm reading is in six volumes, and halfway through volume six last night, I realized I could not support the notion that when I take it back, I will have no Louis in the house. The translation I'm reading is by Francis Arkwright, and it's delightful. But I'll settle for any edition you can find that you trust. Do not mail it. Just buy it and let me know what it costs and keep it there. I'll buy it from you one volume at a time. Hope Nora and the girls are fine. And you. And anybody else who knows me. Helene.